My name is Alistair Jones. I'm an Associate Professor in Politics at De Montfort University, also a University Teacher Fellow. And I am presenting a lecture this evening as part of the De Montfort University Festival of Teaching, which is running all of this week, number of events going on. And today, well, the plan is for me to talk to you about politics. So the whole plan is to be looking at um, what is politics. And I'm just trying to get my slides sorted. There we go. So it's politics, Jim, but not as we know it, is the title of this evening's talk. Now, this comes from the, the title itself. It's that Star Trek in song from way back in the 1980s by a band called The Firm. And when I first thought about giving a talk about politics and how I teach politics and to whom I teach it and other bits and bods like that, I was thinking to myself, well, I need something catchy that might actually entice people. And on my Spotify, as I was relaxing one evening, um, Star Trek came up. I thought, well, I could use something from that. So you've got Lieutenant Uhura going, there's Klingons on the starboard bow. Ooh, there's politics on the starboard bow. doesn't quite work. You can he break the laws of physics? Says, says Scotty. Hmm, you can you break the laws of politics? Well, the prime minister is, so maybe that's not a good one to use. And then it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. Well, that's it. It's politics, Jim, but not as we know it. Now, the other one that I came up with as an alternative was, it's worse than that, he's dead, Jim, which is what McCoy always says. And I thought, it's worse than that, it's politics, Jim. Oh, no, maybe not. That'll terrify people. That'll turn people away. So you probably wouldn't want that. So it's politics, Jim, but not as you know it is the plan. Now, having said all of that, the state of politics today is rather disconcerting, I think, is possibly a, 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 best, a really good way of describing it. And I was reminded of this by a friend of mine on Facebook who shared this quote that is attributed to Alexander Solzhenitsyn we know they are lying. They know they are lying. They know we know they are lying. We know they know we know they are lying. But they are still lying. And that is really a rather sad indictment of how politics is perceived in Britain today and elsewhere around the world as well, that it has not got a good press. In fact, it's got a phenomenally bad press. Now, Having said all of that, I would argue that it's probably had a bad press like that for a very, very long time. So, but as a starting point for this, um, a little bit about me and why all of this matters. So as a nice picture of me um, in my office in the Hugh Aston building at De Montfort University this evening, I am at Shea Jones. Um, so I'm suddenly, if my dog decides to run up the stairs and jump on me, you'll have a Shih Tzu head bobbing in the way. These things happen when we work from home. So I've been a lecturer at Leicester Polytechnic, as it originally was, and De Montfort University now for over 30 years, which is a little bit of a scary thought in itself. And when I first came to Leicester, um, the job that I had was a one year post and it was funded um, by um, Charles Freer's Nursing College because the nursing and midwifery students needed to be taught politics. It's part of teaching um, patients or teaching the nurses how to treat patients holistically. So being aware of politics and what people might think about politics actually mattered. Now, that started off that way. And since then, I have taught hundreds and hundreds of students, none of whom necessarily wanted to study politics. So I've taught journalism students, the module public affairs, um, which is a compulsory part of a professional qualification of being a journalist. I've taught accountancy and finance students about the politics of taxation. I've taught management students about public sector management. And I do broad politics introduction to British politics to HRM students. I've done it to business students. I do the politics of the EU to all sorts of students. So there's all these students who came to university and didn't necessarily want to study politics, didn't know about it, didn't care about it. And I remember there was a student a few years ago, he turned up to a class and he was stomping around the classroom. He sat down, he was in a huff. And I said, what's the matter? He says, I don't see the point in studying politics. It's got nothing to do with what I want to do. I said, but it's got lots of things to do with everything else around you. He goes, no, it hasn't. 
So I said, OK, what interests you? Tell me something that interests you. He was football. Great. I thought I'm on a winner here. Who do you support? Arsenal. Now, this was at a point just after the Brexit referendum. So it was the following academic year. So we're talking October, the following academic year. And I said to the student, OK, we've just got Brexit. We're going to be leaving the EU. Imagine if no EU nationals can work in the UK. Will Arsenal have a football team? And he looked at me, he went, we'll lose half our team. We won't have a team. We won't be able to play. <coughs> and I said to him, well, that's politics. That could be the scenario. Now, it wasn't the scenario because things were sorted out. But the idea was to find that hook and get him actually interested. And from that point, that student turned up to most classes, participated in classes, and actually acknowledged that maybe politics was interesting. So that's a student. But I would argue politics goes further. Now, as I say, when I first came to Leicester, um, it was a one year post, but I, I signed up for one of the local football teams, Scrapton Valley Working Men's Club, uh, playing in the Sunday leagues. And I signed up for other teams as well. And in my time at Leicester, I've played in both county teams and in city teams. And what has been interesting is people ask you, why have you come to Leicester? Which is a fair enough question. I've got a job here. Or right, what do you do? I teach. I don't say I'm a lecturer because that, for some reason, well, terrifies people. So I teach. And a few people I'm looking at, oh, he must be clever, and they leave me alone. The keen ones go, what do you teach? Now, my answer could be politics. It could be politics. Or it could be politics. And it doesn't matter what it is. It's like this tumbleweed. Everyone has gone. I'm at the bar by myself for the rest of the evening, except when it's my round. And I'm thinking, well, you know, why is that? Why is everyone so scared of politics? And one of the things is a lack of knowledge, a lack of awareness, but also all that bad press about it. So what I want to try and do here in this session is actually change perceptions a little bit about politics. Politics matters because if we look at things, um, the problem is. You know, we, we see these sorts of images about politics. So for the sake of balance, I've got both major political parties covered here. So we've got party gates. So Boris Johnson there, the Daily Mail picture um, came from the other pictures from the mirror as well. So Boris Johnson party gate. We've had these parties. Oh, no, they weren't parties. They were work gatherings. They were worth meetings. They were wine and cheese evenings, whatever. You know, the extent to which that Solzhenitsyn quote applies, we know they are lying. They know they are lying. They know we know. You know, that's it there very clearly, Boris Johnson and Partygate. And then also the Conservative mayoral candidate um, having a party during lockdown as well. And they put pictures on social media to celebrate having a party, even though it was in breach of lockdown rules. And you sort of you just despair of them. But as I say, it's not new. We go back to Tony Blair, leader of the Labour Party, prime minister for a number of years. And Blair became Blair. He was a liar with a B in front of it. And those demonised that the Conservative Party used of him, the fact that, you know, could you actually trust him? And the war in Iraq and everything else around that suggests that maybe you couldn't trust him. So we've got all this big politics going on of these people who basically can't be trusted. Do we trust them? No. But it's not just them. There are others as well. OK, we can go internationally and Donald Trump complaining about fake news. So any news that was in the media that questioned his abilities or what he was doing was fake news. Anything that praised him was clearly the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So thank you, Trump. And you sort of you just worry that they, they don't like criticism. Politicians hate criticism. Then you've got um, Dominic Cummings there with the, 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 the fantastic trip to Bernard Castle so that he could have his eyes tested. And you think, well, hang on a minute. You know, this isn't even a politician. This is a political advisor who is breaching the rules of lockdown and then spinning fanciful stories to explain them. The fact that he went to Bernard Castle on the day of his wife's birthday, I am sure, is purely coincidence. And it was about testing his eyesight before driving back to London. And then we have the current Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Was it Culture, Digital, Media and Sport? I never get it the right way around, whichever it is. Nadine Dorries. And this is an image of her in when she was being interviewed on BBC News um, not so long ago. And they were asking about Boris Johnson and Partygate. And if she was the person delegated, the cabinet member is going to stand up today and take all the flack. 
So the opening question to her from Charlie State and BBC Breakfast News was, have you spoken with Mr. Johnson recently? Now, you might expect that the answer be, yes, I have. But the answer came back, why are you asking me this? And sort of the, 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 the confrontation that was immediately put in place, and you think, well, hang on a minute, you're being asked, you know you're coming on air to answer questions about Partygate, why not answer them? But, oh, no, why are you asking me this question? So Charlie State explains why, and then repeats the question. And her response then comes back, we have communicated. And at that point, you think to yourself, well, what on earth is going on here? So you look at these images that we've got here and you think to yourself, people hate politics. It's fairly obvious why. But let's now go to it's politics, Jim, but not as we know it. I want to change things because the reality is it's not that bad. Many, in fact, most politicians are actually honourable people that actually care about the people they represent and want to work for the local communities. But let's forget about the high politics a minute. Let's focus upon mundane matters. I'm going to take a drink for a minute. One of the problems about speaking lecturing is you need to have liquid on the go, otherwise you lose your voice. <coughs> so fairy stories. Now, I like fairy stories. I, I, am, I, I, I have a fascination with them. But let's just think about them for a minute. Did somebody read them to you as a child? Where you sat in bed and one of your parents read to you fairy stories and maybe a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle. Maybe you read them to your own children or to somebody else's children. And the question I have for you is, do you consider them to be political? Now, the reason I ask this is when I'm teaching my students, in particular all these students that don't, haven't been registered to study politics and suddenly find they're studying it, I ask them a nice simple question. Can you think of a subject that does not contain politics? And they come back at me. Oh, the moon. Well, the moon's political. Think of the space race, land a, an astronaut on the moon, Soviet Union versus United States, all part of the Cold War. Nice and easy. What about a beach? Well, actually, the EU had rules and regulations in place about what was a beach, and that included a minimum number of bathers per day per year. No UK beaches met that. So had we applied those rules, we would have had no beaches around the UK, merely stretches of sand. <coughs> Somebody then went clever. What about grains of sand? Well, you've got different types of sand, the categorization, sharp sand, the different sands that can be used for making different forms of concrete. The whole regulation of that process is there. So, you know, if you want to throw questions at me in the chat at the end, we have a Q&A session and all of this. I am more than happy to try and uh, show you how almost anything is political. I think everything is political and I think fairy stories are political. And worse than that, they indoctrinate our children. Now, that's a scary thought. The fact that you're telling these children innocent stories, but within them, there is so much politics and so much you can do this, but you can't do that, or you can only do this in certain circumstances, that it actually gets a little bit disconcerting. Now, alternatively, you might be thinking at this point in time that Alistair is barking mad. These are innocent fairy stories. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at well, several of them. We'll start off with Jack and the Beanstalk. Now, I'm going to presume that most of you know Jack and the Beanstalk, but there are some that don't. I had a bit of a fright this year when some of my students said they'd never heard of the story Jack and the Beanstalk. So very quickly, Jack and his mother live on a farm. They haven't got any food. So Jack has to take a cow to the local market, sell it to get some money so they can buy some food. On the way, he meets a stranger, swaps the cow for some magic beans, comes home, gives his mother the beans. His mother beats him. Now, that's in the ladybird version. That's the version that I read as a child, okay? She beat him and sent him to bed without any supper. She threw the beans out the window. Next morning, there's a giant beanstalk. Jack climbs the beanstalk, and at the top of the beanstalk, there's a cloud, and on the cloud, there's a castle. On three separate occasions, Jack enters the castle and steals something. So he steals um, some gold, a goose that lays golden eggs, and a magic harp. Now, each time he goes into the castle on the first two occasions, the giant afterwards who lives there, goes, sniffs around, goes, fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. And on the third occasion, he sees Jack running away and he chases after Jack. Jack climbs down the beanstalk, chops the beanstalk down, kills the giant. Jack and mother live happily ever after. Hooray! 
Who's the good guy? Jack. Okay. This is someone who has committed three counts of breaking and entering and one count of murder, possibly commutable to manslaughter because of the grind his bones to make my bread. So Jack's the good guy. Now, that's not really a sensible way of looking at things. You know, the fact that the things that he has done are wrong, but he's the good guy. But let's go through the whole story. Jack and his mother are living on a farm. OK, fine. Where's Jack's father? We don't know. That's immaterial to the story. But is it? Maybe he has separated from Jack's mother. Maybe he has died. We don't know. Now, bear in mind that in there are some parts, some people in the United States, for example, very ardent Democrats argue that single parents shouldn't be allowed. The children should be taken off them. And in fact, in the UK, we had such a policy with um, single mothers, children born out of wedlock were taken away from them. And some of them were sent to Australia where they were adopted and they had no contact with the mother thereafter. So Jack is very lucky to be with his mother in these circumstances. But why are they selling the cow? Why not get the cow into calf and then you can milk the cow and sell the milk, make cheese, make butter, all sorts of things. But oh no, this is all short term capitalism. It's all about profit for the next quarter. So he's going to go and sell the cow for some money. They're then going to spend the money on food, eat the food. Then what? Maybe Jack will be sold off to Nike to work for them. I don't know. So Jack goes to the market and on the way he meets a stranger and he swaps the um, cow for magic beans, goes home. Well, we've only had the beating point. Um, so you've got the child abuse there. Um, Jack's mother sends him to bed um, without any supper. They didn't even use the beans to make a casserole. She throws him out the window instead. And the next morning there's a beanstalk. Well, that's GM crops. Now, I've got an allotment. I grow some of my own fruit and veg. And I've got pea plants that in very warm days might grow five, six, seven centimeters. Growing all the way up to the clouds, no chance. But anyway, Jack climbs that beanstalk and at the top on a cloud is a castle. Well, the one word I've got for that is gravity. Either that or the drugs that Jack has been on for maybe eating one or two of those beans. I don't know. Well, anyway, so he enters there. And now I've got the giant statement. Fee, fi, fo, fam, bali, bali, bali. I, I smell the blood of an Englishman. How did he know Jack was English? Now, there's a whole genetic things about different people smell different ways. Um, so you're going to go through, to you, through your eugenics and things like that. I've actually got a simpler explanation of the different European nations that have raped and pillaged around the world over time. The UK is top of the list. France just behind us, Spain running third, America fourth coming up fast. So it was a pretty good, pretty shrewd bet that maybe it was an Englishman that was doing it. So anyway, Jack runs away. Giant eventually takes after him and is killed by Jack as he chops down the beanstalk. So that's this politics. So all this politics in this story. But why is Jack allowed to get away with such things? It's because he looks like us. He acts like us. He is a normal person. The giant is different. The giant is odd. The giant is peculiar. The giant doesn't necessarily look like us. And the implicit message in this story, and not just this story, many other stories as well, is if you look like us and you act like us, you can do naughty things to those people that don't look like us. And there is that sort of that implicit message there. And the sad thing is that then carries on today into a whole host of other people, maybe how they look, the color of their hair, the, their religion, the clothes they wear, that people are being isolated because they look different. And it comes from these stories, these attitudes. Now, it's not just Jack and the Beanstalk. It's not just our culture here in the UK. It is everywhere. So this next slide, I've got three examples from other parts of the world. So starting off with Maui. Now, Maui is a hero in New Zealand, Maori legend. It was he who basically created New Zealand. So he was the youngest of a series of brothers. The brothers went fishing one day. He sneaked on the boat with them. And basically, they didn't send him back home. They let him stay and they're fishing. And he's got a special line and he catches this giant fish. And the canoe is the South Island of New Zealand. And 
the bit that is at Kaikoura, which is on the northeast corner of the South Island of New Zealand, that's where Maui put his foot and broke the boat because the fish was so strong and so heavy. And the fish is the North Island of New Zealand and Lake Taupo in the middle is the, is the eye of the fish. Very quickly at the bottom, Stewart Island, um, at the bottom of the South Island, that's the anchor. So Maui here has superhuman strength. He is the strongest of all his brothers and all his big brothers are envious of him. He's created New Zealand, but there's a whole host of other things he then does. And in some respects, what you find about Maui is he, yes, he's a hero, but he's also a bit of a trickster. And also he can be quite a nasty piece of work. So he didn't like the fact that the sun chose when it wanted to rise and set. So he persuaded his brothers to go hunting and they caught the sun in a net and they beat the sun to force it to rise in the east in the morning and to set in the west. So we've got this violence in the hero and he catches um, the god of fire as well because he wants to control fire and basically kills the god. He hunts a giant. He can't kill the giant, so he buries the giant. And the giant in one of the stories is Banks Peninsula in the South Island of New Zealand, uh, just beside where Christchurch is. And basically, every time the giant moved, he heaped more and more soil on the giant until he suffocated and died. And this is Maui, the hero. The Monkey King. Chinese, um, also possibly Indian stories here. Um, basically, monkey fights different creatures um, as he's escorting a monk from India back to China, um, who is to turning some Buddhist books to China. OK, sounds nice and wonderful to begin with. And monkey is the symbol of freedom, being able to do what you want to do, resistance to authority and also individual heroism. Now, the scary thing about Monkey is he is not necessarily um, a, a proper authoritarian figure. So yes, he's the Monkey King, but he's anti-authority. And actually he fights authority, he questions authority, he challenges them. And in some cases, he plays nasty tricks on them. He hurts people in authority or those working on behalf of those in authority. And he's allowed to do it because he is the hero. So the question here is, with someone like the Monkey King, is do we actually want to be that type of person where we challenge authority? Now, sometimes challenging authority is good. But is challenging authority using violence really the best way forward? I would question that. And finally, we have Baba Yaga, who is a... Um, Slavic um, legend, so Eastern Europe, Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere. And she is basically a witch and she is considered to be the most evil, the most terrible of all witches in that what she wants to do is to steal, cook and eat children. Now, the interesting thing with Baba Yaga is she lives alone in the woods in a cottage on chicken legs. And basically the cottage is always looking away so nobody can look in. Now, in some of the stories, Baba Yaga is actually a good witch and she helps the hero or the heroine. And in other stories, she is evil. But what we see is when you talk of Baba Yaga, you tend to think of the evil witch who is going to steal and eat children. And the scary thing about this is many younger children see an old lady living by herself and they assume she's a witch. And they assume that she's evil and they want to stay away from her. They don't trust her. They're scared of her. Now, that's not just in Slavic culture. That is in many parts of the world. An, an old woman living by herself is a witch. And maybe you'll throw stones at the witch because you don't trust the witch because she's going to eat children. And these are the types of messages that are in the stories that we're telling our children, which is scary, disconcerting, worrying even. So let's come back to something that appears to be nicer. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Another fantastic story. Let's think about it. Goldilocks, lovely little girl with her glow, long flowing hair, skips through the woods, sees a cottage and walks straight into it. What would have happened to you if your parents found out that you'd walked into somebody's cottage like that and then eaten some porridge, smashed up some furniture because you tried to sit on it and broke it? and then fell asleep on the beds there. 
imagine how the bear family felt when they came home and eventually they, they, they see all the damage that is done. And then they see Goldilocks sleeping in baby bear's bed and she wakes up and runs away and lives happily ever after. Now, that's not particularly fair. Imagine how traumatized little baby bear is. Now, OK, it's a bit of a challenge maybe to think about bears live in houses. But let's park that for one side for just now. Poor little baby bear smashed up a, his, his own little favorite chair. So the next day in the sequel to Goldilocks and the Three Bears, we have a chair for baby bear. They've got to go shopping the next day to find a replacement chair for baby bear. And they go looking through all the different shops and they can't find anything. Nothing is appropriate. It's too big, too small, too soft, too firm. So they can't find any. And they come back home. And wow, isn't it exciting? In the house, Goldilocks has been back and has left a replacement chair. Isn't that really nice of her? Now, my feeling is, and maybe I'm being a bit of a, a cynic here, is that she is trying to buy off their silence. She is trying to cover up her actions of breaking and entering and damaging the property. And the reality is this is what we should be seeing instead. Goldilocks being charged for breaking and entering. But oh, no, she is the heroine. She is allowed to get a both thing because she looks like us. The bears are different. They deserve everything they get. So more and more in these stories, that's the sort of message that we're getting. And I, you know, I despair of it sometimes as to what sort of things I've been told to children about what is acceptable behavior and what is not. I remember as a child seeing a, a rainbow at one time and wondering, oh, I'm going to go off find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I'm packing some sandwiches into a bag. And my mother says to me, what on earth are you doing? And I said, rainbow, pot of gold. It's a story, Alistair. It's not true. And I'm suddenly thinking to myself, how many other things have I been told are not true? How many other stories? What's in them that are false? So maybe it was at that point when I was five or six years old that I started to think about politics in all of these stories. We'll move on. To a character that is considered to be the cutest of all cutie, little cutie pies, sweetie pie. In my opinion, the most evil, nasty of all cartoon characters. Vindictive is an understatement. OK, Tweety Pie is terrified because Sylvester the cat wants to eat. Fine, run away, hide, no problem at all. But if Sylvester is hanging from a building and going got holding on with three claws, Tweety Pie comes along, picks off one claw, picks off the second, picks off the third and goes, oh dear, how sad these things do happen. What a nasty, horrible little animal Sweetie Pie is. But little cute children can get away with such things because they're like Sweetie Pie. They're cutie pies. And it's a little bit, as I say, it's disconcerting that we see this sort of person here being revered as a hero, being wonderful, being fantastic. But the reality is they're not. Now, I could have gone to Roadrunner. Roadrunner is sometimes a bit vindictive, but maybe Wiley Coyote ought to have thought more carefully in regard to the plans that he was using to catch Roadrunner. But the fact that Roadrunner could actually go through a picture and then a train come out of the picture and flatten Wiley Coyote, you know, I think the odds are stacked against him. Wiley Coyote is never going to catch Roadrunner. Sweetie Pie is never going to be caught by Sylvester. But Sweetie Pie is not a nice character. And from here, we go to this character. Now, I met Boris Johnson many, many years ago before he was even mayor of London. He was just an MP. He'd been on talk shows. Of, I got news for you and things like that. And I was at an event in London and we were talking about citizenship. And he came along, guest of honor, to do a speech to everyone there. He and I were chatting away for 10, 15 minutes. And great, was, all things were going fine. And then his aide came along and said, Mr. Johnson, you're on in a minute. And he ruffled up his hair. And he was mad Boris, just as pictured here. And that's how he went on. And he was mad Boris on the stage. And it was a totally different person to I'd met. And the thing is, this caricature of mad Boris has become the norm. So we forgive Boris for holding those parties because he's really one of us. Yeah, we like him. We trust him. You know, we could have a drink with him. Keir Starmer's boring. We can't have a drink with him. You know, he's a bit dull. But Mad Boris is an act. 
Boris Johnson is arguably one of the most calculating politicians that we have, but it is the act that has endeared him to much of the population of the UK. And that act possibly wore a little thin during the COVID pandemic, has possibly worn a little thin over the Brexit negotiations, but it still leaves him as being, people seeing him thinking, oh, he's actually one of us, he's not actually that bad, you know, we can get on with him, he could go and have a beer with him. The reality is significantly different. Would he necessarily want to go for a beer with Joe Public or Mrs Public? I don't think so. He is much more comfortable in his own environment with his own ilk. So that's to bring the whole story back from politics, isn't it horrible, isn't it nasty, through children's fairy stories where there's those implicit messages, to finish back with the Prime Minister. Prime Minister who will carry on leading the country because he can't be removed until his party remove him or until there's a general election, probably in 2024. Right, on that, some concluding thoughts. The messages in most of those stories that I've gone through, they're all about conforming. Do as you're told, stay in line, fit in. If you do that, if you see others that are not fitting in, they look different, they act different, you can do things against them. Okay, you can be naughty, killing them, probably not, hurting them, probably not, but yeah, throw stones at their windows, why not? They probably deserve it. And if you are different, if you act differently, you dress differently, you have different interests, bad things will happen to you and you will deserve it. So what we've got in all of these messages is conform. So even Boris Johnson conforms to a stereotype that we think of that eccentric Englishman who is a bit mad, you know, doesn't talk about playing table tennis or ping pong. It's whiff waff, as he called it. But all of this. It's politics. We just don't necessarily see it as politics, but it is politics. The messages that are there, the indoctrination that is there, it is all politics. It is political. Now, if you think, oh, no, it's just a story. Yes, they are all just stories. But in those stories are very clear messages of what we can and can't do. How our heroes Yes, they've got flaws, but they're allowed to have those flaws because there are heroes. And if you don't conform, if you don't fit in, things will happen to you and it will be your own fault. Now, on that particular point, I'm going to draw this section to a close. We've got about 25 minutes left or so. I wanted to leave plenty of time for people to ask questions. So, um, Go for it. Anybody, do we have any? I'm now flicking to the comments side here. Um, any comments, any questions, anything anybody wants to ask, any subjects that you think that don't contain politics? Now is the chance. Okay, we've got a couple of questions come in. Right, Bob Wilson, how far should challenging authority go, um, e.g. dictator assassination? Um, that's a really good question, Bob. Um, right, let, let's be very, very clear. For point number one, this is my all my own personal opinion here. Make that very, very clear. Assassination of a dictator? No, definitely not. I would never, ever contone one government potentially assassinating other or even the public assassinating that person. On the one hand, you assassinate the person who is going to replace them. Are they going to be any better, any worse? Now, as for challenging authority, yes. So we saw, for example, in Russia, a Russian journalist putting a sign up telling people in Russia, look, there is a war in Ukraine. It's going on and we shouldn't be objecting to it. Challenging the authority like that. Yes, it can work. It does work. The problem is how you then develop a groundswell of opinion. So I am all for challenging authority verbally. I am, I am very reluctant about using violence of any form against persons in authority. You use violence against them, they will use more violence back against you, and then you descend into a horrible circle. 
So that challenging of authority, yes, we should. We should be challenging them at all times, be it a democracy, be it a dictatorship. The question is how. Now, there are some people who are willing to challenge authority and are willing to sacrifice their lives to do so. Now, on, this is where I get split. On the one hand, I think it's phenomenally brave of someone to actually do something like that. But on the other hand, I'm thinking to myself, well, what about everyone that you are leaving behind now? How you know? How is your your action going to leave them? So you know, I I, I have split feelings on that one. But it's a really good question. Um, but as I say, assassination, absolutely not. Um, fundamentally opposed to that. I would rather have those individuals being brought to trial for their actions, being charged, found guilty, and imprisoned. You know, I'm opposed to the death penalty as well. I think if someone should be imprisoned for life for the, some of the, the the crimes that they may have committed so that they suffer that lack of freedom and everything else that comes with it with incarceration so really good question bob thank you okay jemima do you think the younger generation is becoming less conforming it seems like they are challenging authority more often um really good question jemima <sighs> Now, the issue is uh, less conforming is a bit of a challenge, because if you go back to the 1960s and 1970s, we see the real birth in a younger generation wanting to challenge authority. So we see it through the mods and the rockers, for example, in the 1960s. We see it through the flower power generation as well, coming into the 70s. We see it through punks in the 1970s and into the 80s as well. So there's lots of different ways of that the younger generation are challenging what is going on. I think what is interesting today is that because of the technology that's available, some younger people are less conforming through what they're saying and what they're doing in social media and um, things like that. Are they actually challenging authority more often? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I, th I, think that I think the difference is the challenging authority is not about trying to pull down the government or trying to change the whole political system. But rather, it's about these days seems to be more about challenging different sources of authority. So younger people are very much challenging um, businesses and other companies as to what is going on. So they're challenging Tesco in regard to the products that, 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 that are on the shelves or any of the other major supermarkets or they're challenging clothes suppliers because the clothes are not being produced ethically and things like that. So I think what we see here is more challenging of other sources of authority rather than necessarily political authority. And as for less conforming, um, I think the more people try to, hey, I'm not conforming, I'm conforming less, the more they look like they are conforming. So everyone is conforming by trying not to conform so the way the clothes that people wear or for example or oh, i'm not going to have nice clothes i'll have ripped jeans so everyone is wearing ripped jeans and if you're not wearing ripped jeans well there's something odd about you you're not conforming so i think the more we push less conforming the more pressure there is to actually conform to that lack of conformity which sounds a little bit odd in how it goes around but um yeah so Different sorts of less conforming, I think, maybe that may be the way for going forward, finding different ways to conform. So I know that I've been to teach in China a number of occasions. What was interesting in that the first year I went to um, where I was teaching in China, one or two students had dyed their hair. Last time I was there, just before the COVID pandemic, almost a quarter of the class were dyeing their hair. It was as if dyeing your hair was the new, yes, I'm not conforming, I'm dyeing my hair. But they were all conforming by dyeing it, even though they were using slightly different colours. So that's that one there. Right. So thank you for that question, Jemima. Oh, one coming via DMU events. OK, at what age do you think children should be taught politics in school? Should we be asking them to pick apart fairy stories when they're old enough to understand? I'll, I'll do the second one first. I think, yes, we should get the children to be thinking about the fairy stories and about the 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 messages that are in there about what is acceptable behavior and what is not. And, you know, why is Jack allowed to kill the giant? You know, th that one really bothers me. It's, it's one that sort of sticks quite a lot. 
Um, so I think we should be asking, we should be trying to develop this criticality to ask questions. I think one of the things that I find is that, you know, it's almost like children discouraged to ask questions because if you ask questions, you don't understand. If you don't understand, you're stupid. And I think we've got to get that out of children's minds that asking questions is a good thing. Asking questions, challenging questions is a great thing. OK, as to the age children should be taught politics. Now, the question becomes on there, what do we mean by politics? So if we're talking about, you know, conservative labor, general elections and things like that, um, I think aspects of that ought to be being taught at primary school. So why you know, we have a general election every four or five years. What is a general election? Why are we holding them? Who is the prime minister? What does the prime minister do? And just bring in some of those aspects of political structures, if you like, into education. Now, let's be clear. I'm not talking about indoctrination, how we must love the prime minister, how we must question the leader of the opposition because they're the opposition. I think it's more about creating an awareness of we have a prime minister. What does the prime minister actually do? And the fact that Boris Johnson is the current prime minister, our previous prime minister was Margaret Thatcher, Theresa May, we've had both men and women as prime ministers. What do they actually do? Do they actually do the same job or do they do different things? And start off with basic things like that. But the problem is, the difficult part is to make it interesting and engaging. Because a lot of the stuff that's taught at for example, A-level politics, or what was AS-level politics, I mean, there was citizenship there. A lot of it was actually dull, boring, and tedious, says him who was involved in drawing up part of the syllabus for the citizenship ones. So the question is, you know, how do we get people engaged in politics? How do we create that interest? And that is actually the challenge. And I don't necessarily have an answer. You know, I play around, I find hooks, something that interests students. So the, the, the football example I gave at the beginning, it's finding something that you can then link to the politics so they can go, oh, and once you've got that, oh, aspect, then you've got a hook. And once you've got that hook, you can then encourage and nurture. But it's a long, slow process. What is your opinion on the problem that people are becoming less and less in politics today? I believe that people who are not interested in politics may be a threat to democracy. Um, Ilya, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think there is a need for people to be aware in politics. And I say the problem, as I showed at the start, is when we see politics being discussed, being debated, it's always high politics. It is always the politicians. These guys are bad. And the, the, the party gate thing. It's interesting how people are really angry about party gate, but the investigations that Sue Gray put forward and then, oh, no, it's a police investigation. And now we're waiting for the police to respond. People have gone, oh, I've had enough. And the problem is, I think some of the politicians actually wanted that reaction. So people are fed up with it. We can move on. We can talk about something else. So the, you know, there, there needs to be in some respects, a speed to politics. So when there's these sorts of issues, there needs to be a clear investigation. There needs to be clear accountability because without it, people become less interested and that's a threat to democracy. And what you get left with is those who are really, really interested in politics who want to be politicians, making rules that suit themselves and then imposing them on everybody else and nobody challenging them. So in that respect, uh, people are becoming less and less involved and interested in politics. I think that's actually the case. But I think it's because of how politics is being portrayed in the media and how the politicians are acting and how the media sensationalise aspects of politics. Some of them very, very basic mundane things. So a parish councillor works for the local community to open up a, a small park in a small village. That's brilliant. But nobody's really interested in that because it's not sensational enough. And I think that's where the frustration lies in the media have got to sell copy. They've got to sell advertising. They've got to sensationalize things. So councillor X working in the small community and getting a result for the kids in that community is absolutely brilliant and should be celebrated. But it doesn't get media coverage. And therefore, the local community might go, oh, yes, we've got the swing. Well, it was the politician that helped get you that. Yes, but we've got the swing. So the politics sometimes gets lost in all of that, which sometimes is a bad thing because the politicians should be recognised when they do good things. But at the same time, you know, they've actually achieved something. Let's celebrate the achievement. So really good comments there, Ilya. I like that. Observation from Broadcliffe Parish Council. I'm writing a book on parish councils at the minute. I might have to speak with you about this at a later date. 
there is a desirable balance to achieve between conformity and healthy challenge. That challenge we don't involve. Absolutely agree with that. Yes. And that mix of, OK, when do you cross the line? What is acceptable behavior and what is not? When can you challenge? When can you question? So I made a comment um, on Radio Leicester um, that if the um, current MP loses her appeal in the courts, then there may be a by-election in Leicester East where I live. And I'm looking forward to Boris Johnson coming to Leicester East and campaigning. And I want to be there. I want to challenge him. I want to question him. Now, I'm not going to be um, necessarily attacking him, but I want to challenge some of the things that he said. And I want that I want that to be in the public domain that, you know, you can challenge politicians. You can ask questions. That's why programs like Question Time on the BBC are so good, where the public can actually ask politicians questions. I think back to 1992 general election when John Major, the prime minister, went around on his soapbox, interacting with the public, answering questions. Now, I thought that was absolutely brilliant because he took questions from anybody and everybody wherever he went around the country and the public got to engage with him. And I think what is sometimes being lost is that that link between the politicians and the public, that they don't come door knocking very often. They don't have the, the hustings on the street corners where you can actually go out and you can challenge them and sometimes heckle them. There's nothing wrong with heckling. Heckling can be a good thing. I will confess to heckling a colleague a little bit today in a meeting, but it was to make a point. So, yeah, I've, I've digressed a little bit from your observation, but I absolutely agree with that challenge. We don't evolve. Yes, definitely so. Does well-perceived misinformation, fake news and propaganda mean that one cannot make an informed political decision? Wow, Bob, that's a fantastic question. I think that with propaganda, fake news and misinformation, it is a lot more difficult to make informed decisions. Um, now, I, I, I've been discussing the media with my with my first year students, HRM students, so they're, they're, so they're, they're, they're not big on politics and actually asking them, you know, what news sources do they trust? And what was interesting, some of them came back. One of them came back, oh, I trust the BBC. I'm an overseas student. We see the BBC. We have the World Service. You know, that's more reliable than our home media. And, you know, that, 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 that's interesting. But finding out the difference between fake news and real news, yeah, it's very difficult. And sometimes it takes time. What we also need, therefore, is when the media do make a mistake, when the fake news is demonstrated to be fake, that they've got to apologise and correct it in the same way that politicians ought to apologise and correct things when they get things wrong. OK, so it is a lot more difficult to make informed political decisions. I absolutely agree with you. And unfortunately, what that means is investing some time to actually explore and find out. And that's where we then strike some of the other problems that have arisen. People have become less engaged because they don't want to spend the time finding out what is the truth. What are the facts? What are the different perspectives? What are the different opinions? It's much easier to say, here is the answer. Move on. There's nothing to see here. Move on. Even though there's a huge fire blazing behind you. So, yeah, it is very difficult. So some of the misinformation and fake news that is deliberately calculated to be fake, but to be presented as reality, it needs to be challenged. It needs to be questioned as well so that people can be informed. But it is sometimes very difficult to see what is fake news and what is real news. Yeah. What would you say to people who only interact with politics on a national level and ignore parish councils and local government because they have no power and don't do anything? OK, to everyone, just to let you know, James Kendrick, who is asking this, has just been made a parish councillor. Well done, James. I'm really proud of you for doing that. Um, yeah, it's a big issue. And again, where I'm going to put part of the blame on this is the media. So when we have local elections, the BBC or Sky News or whoever say, oh, look, here's the results. If it was a general election, this is how Parliament would look. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. We didn't have any voting in Leicester or Leicestershire at these elections. Why are you saying that? It's a total misrepresentation. And part of the problem is that we've got a national media who want to talk about national stories to the public. And that's the only way they can present it. And the problem is that local government and parish councils get ignored. They get omitted until you get a, um, a situation with a particular parish council where somebody comes in to take over and the parish council's objective puts, gets put on um, social media and suddenly parish councils are the laughing stock of the news. 
So what I would say is local government parish councils do have power and can do things and do many, many things, and they don't get appreciated for it. What they get is they get it in the neck. So we had austerity from 2010 onwards and local government budgets were cut massively. Services were cut as a result. And central government turned around and said, it's local government's fault. They've cut the services. And everyone forgot that Leicester City Council, for example, is 60 million cut from its budget. Now, that's an awful lot of money for the council to carry on delivering all of the services that it has to deliver. And some of those are ring fenced and those services it has to cut. So it's not cutting park grasses as much. It's not doing road verges as much because it hasn't got the money to be able to do so because of the cuts from the centre. And all that happens is parish councils and local government get the blame. So the BBC did a thing about parish councils saying, well, oh, look, look, look at parish councils. You know, the, the, the precept that it's gone up by 10 percent. Yes, it went up by 10 pence, but it's 10 percent. It's huge. And, you know, well, OK, it's gone up by that. But what are they doing with that money? Why have they put it up? And it's about exploring that. And sometimes what we need is local and regional media to be actually focusing on local councils, on regional councils, on parish councils, what they're doing and getting the message out to everyone. Another observation, you've mentioned our political figures make calculated moves. It seems if politics is a game. Yes, for a lot of them, it is. Boris Johnson, very open about this at the time of Brexit. He wrote two newspaper articles, one arguing we should leave, one arguing we should stay. And he decided to go with the leave one. That was a calculated plan to enable him as a stepping stone to become the Conservative Party leader and ultimately prime minister. And there are a lot of politicians that are that calculating. Very much so. Now, let's be clear. The vast majority of people who are involved in politics are not treating it as a game. The parish councillors, the local councillors, be it district boroughs, unitaries, be it county councils, the vast majority of them care about their local community, care about what's going on, and they want to make people's lives better. But the reality is that those, once you get up further up that chain into central government, once you start climbing the greasy pole to get in the cabinet, everything you do is calculated. So look at the resignations of government ministers and Theresa May's government, that they stepped down because they didn't like her Brexit deal. How much of that was calculated to further their political career rather than because it was a uh, an ethical resignation? So, yeah, it's something that happens a lot. And so I absolutely agree with you. A lot of the top political figures, it is a game for them. It's about how they can improve themselves, how they can make themselves look better. And sometimes the knock on effect is they make themselves look a hell of a lot worse. As you can see, I'm getting to pause for breath for a second um, as I you know, I bounce off the walls a lot. I get really, really enthusiastic. I am very passionate about my subject. So I love people asking questions. So I have a question for everyone else. Is there any subjects you can think of that don't contain politics? OK, we've got a couple more questions coming up in the chat. OK, so Ilya is asking, as an international student, how can I get involved in the political life of the community and city? Right. Um, really, really good question. Um, Peter Soulsby, the mayor of Leicester, made, made a comment about this um, at a talk that he gave the, um, on when he was in, in, in conversation with the vice chancellor. And... Um, you know, his starting point was always join a political party and see what you can do to help them. I would say, you know, if it's a particular pressure group that you're interested in, their particular concern, I would say join those, get involved that way. But most UK politics centres around political parties. So if it's a particular party that you, you have an affinity with, maybe go along to one of their meetings, find out what is going on. Um, it is at, the political parties all around the country are always looking for young people, activists to get involved. Some of the things they're going to ask you to do are phenomenally boring. So you'll go door knocking, you'll be putting leaflets to people's doors. Now and again, you might knock on a door and someone like me answers the door. Going, Yay! And I can ask you all sorts of questions and absolutely terrify you. Um, 
that happened the other day. The, the, the particular councillors were knocking on the door, putting leaflets, and somebody said, no, don't knock at that door. And it was too late. They'd already knocked, and I'd been down the stairs and opened the door before the first person finished speaking. And I doorstepped them for 15 minutes talking politics. I like doing things like that. It's part of it. So getting involved, it's a party, it's a pressure group, and work on it from there. Okay, broad plus pouch cancer. Many people don't differentiate between the politics of local level decision making and political games. Again, I would absolutely agree. And this is the a lot of it is a perception about individual politicians and what they're doing and how they're calculating. Now, at the end of the day, for politicians, their aim is always to get re-elected. That's what they want to do. A successful politician is a politician who gets re-elected again and again and again. And she or he live and die by that politically. So Sometimes that political game playing is going ahead and it is very difficult for people and they struggle to differentiate between what is a cynical move to get re-elected and what is actually a, you know, a, a sensible local decision that is actually that needs to be being made. So, yeah, you're absolutely right on that one, Brooklyn's Parish Council. I agree with you entirely. It is a struggle to differentiate and many people don't. They see it all as a game. Absolutely the case. OK, I think ilia has got uh, uh, something in there in the chat. Science. OK, not, uh, science is a relatively straightforward one to argue. You can look at the science of eugenics and how that was politicised. You've said so yourself in your comments there with Nazi Germany. But even including science in the national curriculum, which aspects of science should be included? Do we teach the students physics? Do we teach them chemistry? Do we teach them biology? Do we teach them a mix? You know, so what are the requirements to then go and study at university in any of those subjects? You've got to have done A-levels. Do you have to get a particular level? How much science do you need to be to become a GP or a doctor or a dentist? So science is there and it's part of our curriculum. And that's a political decision. Not necessarily big P politics of politicians making it, but the organisations represent GPs and doctors and the training involved. They stipulate what is needed and that's a political decision. So that is, um, yeah, that that's, suddenly opens a whole host of other issues around what is politics. Thank you for that, Ilya. That, I think, appears to be it. Oh, no, we've got something else. Uh, video games political. Oh, yes. Um, there, there was, um, oh, what was it? Sim City was a was a video game. I remember computer game. Um, good heavens, we're talking twenty five plus years ago now. And what was interesting about that is that the upper ceiling that you could charge for taxes was twenty percent. It was an American based system. So some of you, know, if you wanted to tax higher than twenty percent, you couldn't. And things like hospitals, they weren't under the control of the mayor. They were private sector. So there's a very clear example. Video games are political. Yes, definitely the case. Any subject I've been thinking about me start to drill down. Everything in Adelia says it's feet in some sort of policy from sports to listening to music. Absolutely the case. Yes. Um, one of my favorite bands is Talking Heads, and they have a brilliant song called Don't Worry About the Government. And it's all about political corruption, you know. So, yeah, absolutely the case. So you can get yeah, sport. I lived in New Zealand for a while and um, the Springboks during the apartheid regime came to tour and play rugby in New Zealand. And one of the games got called off because there was a pitch invasion of protesters um, at Hamilton. Again, they were supposed to be playing Waikato. And there were huge protest marches around the country objecting to the Springboks coming to tour in New Zealand. So, yeah, that's a very clear example. And we see also the um, with the Paralympic Games, the Russian and um, I think it was the Belarus athletes were prevented from participating. So, yeah, politics, hugely. Mos the, the Moscow Olympics, 1980, LA Olympics, 1984, boycotting of those. Boycotting of the 1976 Commonwealth Games by African countries as well. So, yeah, loads of politics in all of that. OK, so it's gone half past six. This is a really scary how quickly time flies. Um, I would like to thank everyone for the questions that you have asked. 
I have, I, I really enjoy being able to answer questions like this. I tell my students this all the time. They don't believe me. Hopefully some of them have been here listening to all of this. I hope you've all got something out of it. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, yeah, and the, the festival of teaching carries on for the rest of the week. Um, the link is there in the chat from the DMU event. So please come and attend some of the other events. Many of my colleagues are doing events well worth experiencing, broadening your horizons into different subjects. So thank you all very much for this. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, maybe we'll get to do something like this again soon face to face. Who knows? Thank you all.